you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com, thechrisvossshow.com. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. We certainly appreciate you guys coming by the show today. Today, we're going to be talking about the mind, the malady of the mind, schizophrenia and the path to prevention. We have the author of the newest book out, February 21st, 2023. It just came out. Jeffrey A. Lieberman is going to be on the show with us today. We're going to be talking about uh, maladies of the mind, uh, specifically his book, Schizophrenia, and uh, other different things. We're going to talk about a few different things, narcissism, uh, psychiatry, mental illness, and pretty much uh, everything about Chris Voss there is to know. Because as you know, as my audience for 13 years, I might not be straight in the brain. But uh, he's going to decide if uh, I have any help or not, or if I should probably have a frontal lobotomy. Anyway, as always, we refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. We love all the great uh, referrals and uh, things that you put on iTunes with those five-star reviews saying how great the show is and how much it helps you expand your mind. And that's the great thing about this show. If you're smarter, you're sexier in life, and you'll make more money and uh, everything else. Those aren't guaranteed. The lawyer said I can't uh, guarantee those in any way, shape, or form. But I can I can just kind of make stuff up because that's what we do on the show. <laughs> anyway, guys, I'm kidding. Go to YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Foss, Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, the big LinkedIn newsletter, the big LinkedIn group, uh, all the stuff that we do across social media. Check that out as well. As I mentioned, he's the author of the latest book, Malady of the Mind, Schizophrenia, and the Path to Prevention. You can order it. Wherever fine books are sold, but stay away, stay away from those alleyway bookstores because uh, you might need a tetanus shot. I tripped in one the other day, and, and uh, I've got some gangrene, but uh, I'll have to get another doctor on the show for that. Anyway, uh, Jeffrey uh, Lieberman is a professor and Constance and Stephen Lieber Chair in the Psychiatry at the Columbia University Vagilis. Uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons. Throughout his 40-year career, he has focused on research and clinical care of patients with serious mental illness. That might be his next case. Uh, in addition to his academic and clinical activities, he has played a significant role in influencing government and social policy. In fact, if anybody needs mental health, if uh, you... It's it's people in government, and not all people, I should say, just maybe some of those senators and House members, in my opinion, that is. Uh, let's see. He's played a significant role in influencing government social policy, educating health care providers and the public in an effort to reduce stigma and improve access to and quality of mental health care. Welcome to the show, Jeffrey Lieberman. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me, Chris. Thanks for coming. It's an honor to have you. Uh, we love having brilliant minds on the show because I'm not one of them. Uh, give us a dot .com so people can find you on the interwebs, please, sir. It's uh, uh, JeffreyLiebermanMD.com. That's my website uh, URL. There you go. So uh, this is, uh, I think, your second, or how many books do you have? Uh, in? The well, I've, I've written, believe it or not, 800 scientific Holy articles. Holy crap. I've been I've written 17 books for professional uh, doctors and scientists, but this is my second book for the uh, public. There you go. There you go. So the public can indulge in this. Uh, so what motivated you to write your latest book here, Malady of the Mind? Well, I had never written for the lay public uh, before. And then I realized that, you know, if you have an illness, you want to know what the cause is and what the treatment is. And what I came to realize uh, after sort of stepping out of the ivory tower of academia where you're doing your research and discovering all these new things was that uh, the problem with mental, you know, if you get sick, if you have cancer, let's say you're a woman and you feel a lump and you get, go to a hospital and they diagnose you and they say, oh, we well, have breast cancer and we believe you need a lumpectomy and a chemotherapy and radiation. Um, and you can pretty much get that most places, not everywhere. If you have a mental illness, people don't understand what it is to begin with, how to recognize it, mm -hmm. and they're not sure where to go to get treatment for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the treatment isn't widely available. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, 
okay, we've got we've got vaccines for COVID, or we've got you know vaccines for polio, or we've got you know treatment for diabetes, but it's not available. People don't know what kind of doctors to go to. In fact, when I wrote my first book in 2015, it was called Shrinks: The Untold Story of Psychiatry. I started off with an epigram from Samuel Goldwyn, you know, of the Metro Goldwyn Ameristry, who said, anybody that sees a psychiatrist needs to have their head examined. <laughs> and that said to me that uh, psychiatry, my chosen specialty, was the Rodney Dangerfield of medical specialties, meaning it didn't get any respect. Mm-hmm. And I feel that that is untrue, and it is to the detriment of people who may suffer from mental disorders and need treatment, which is available, but they either don't believe in it, they don't know where to find it, or they're not sure if they actually have something that requires searching for it. Yeah. I, it's something that uh, people need to um, need to adhere to more. Um, and so this is, so why did you specifically decide to write about schizophrenia when there's uh, so many other wonderful um, maladies people can have in the brain, like mine? Well, <laughs> Well, you know, schizophrenia is the kind of the poster child of mental illnesses. So, oh. first of all, let's make a distinction, Chris. Mm-hmm. There's a distinction between mental illnesses and the worried well. That's my, you know, kind of glib term for uh, the ups and downs of daily life, uh, the vicissitudes of one's emotional state, you know, in relation to their work or their home life or how things are going for them socially and so forth. Um, Everybody has variations in their mood, in their ability to concentrate and focus and how they perceive things. Um, But they're able to sort of keep it within bounds and eventually sort of uh, stabilize in a tolerable mental condition where they can function and they're not in mental distress. I mean, except if you're living in you know, Ukraine and right now under war conditions or you've got a death in your family that's causing you to grieve. Mm. But mental illness is when you have a disturbance in thinking, mm. emotion regulation, mm-hmm. uh, perception that goes beyond whatever your circumstances are, uh, persists for a not just a few minutes or a few hours, but you know, weeks or months, um, mm-hmm. and causes disability, you're not able to function well, and causes distress. And although there are many mental disorders, and we're not talking about you know, the kind of questionable things about internet gaming disorder or, or something like that, we're talking about schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, melancholic depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, addiction, autism, dementia. Um, uh, the one that people probably have the most vivid impression of is schizophrenia because schizophrenia is the equivalent of insanity, madness, lunacy. It's, it's the homeless person in the street in the middle of winter standing there with no shoes in the snow. Mm. It's the figure that's portrayed in uh, um, a movie, whether it's Psycho or Shutter Island uh, or something like that. Um, and it's the scary, mysterious, you know, uh, uh, figure that um, people fear, uh, even serial killers. Um, when I first began training in psychiatry, I came to New York in 19, late 1970s, and Son of Sam, uh, David Berkowitz, was a serial killer on the loose. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Unabomber came afterwards. Um, Now, this is not to say that people with schizophrenia are very violent, but these types of individuals who are mentally ill and resort to these kinds of behaviors get tremendous attention because the media knows that these uh, uh, stories are sensational and they get eyes on and Mm -hmm. ratings. And so it's in the public's mind. And I wanted to dispel the mystery and also the pessimism that you know, you're doomed from the womb if you have that condition, that there is treatment for you, and it's even actually preventable. Mm-hmm. And probably important to seek help if you feel that you have it or maybe a loved one is suffering from it, right? You want to know something, Chris? Um, if you have chest pain uh, that turns out to be angina or a heart attack, um, 
you may delay going to see a doctor or going to the hospital, but it's probably not more than a few days or maybe in weeks. The average amount of time from when a person, and this usually occurs between a certain window, uh, late adolescence and early adulthood, 15 to 25, that's when the onset occurs. When people begin to experience symptoms to when they actually see a mental health professional and get diagnosed, mm -hmm. is over a year. Wow. So there's a lot of delay during which bad stuff can happen before anybody comes to the possibility of treatment. And why is that? Is, it, is, is there some sort of, do we need to start, uh, you know, addressing mental illness more in this country where we need to say, hey, man, get some help right away. Uh, no, don't wait. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But um, first of all, uh, the fact that the, on, the period of onset, the window of onset age-wise, you know, just like Alzheimer's disease doesn't occur till you're elderly. Mm. Or autism occurs in the first 24 years of life. Um, schizophrenia's period of onset is 15 to 25 by and large. Wow. Um, but that's a period that people are going through changes. You mm -hmm. know, as an adolescent, you're experimenting with things, you're maturing, you're developing your own identity, you're becoming independent. Um, and it's hard to know what are just the, uh, the normal fluctuation of kids going through those maturational stages and what are the uh, harbingers of an imminent uh, mental illness like schizophrenia. So, um, you know, parents and pediatricians and others are, are, you know, they are giving people slack thinking, oh, they're going through a phase, mm -hmm. uh, which is true. Um, uh, the other thing is that people don't know what to look for. Mm. They don't know what the prodromal or the warning signs are. You know, if you are experiencing pain in your chest, uh, it radiates down your arm. Mm -hmm. um, you might think, oh, is it, you know, is it just, you know, heartburn or maybe it's, uh, I bump myself and it's, you know, my rib attaching to my sternum mm -hmm. um, or maybe it's, you know, uh, the beginning symptoms of coronary artery disease. Yeah. Uh, so you have, you can narrow it down, but when it comes to aberrant behavior, mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult because it overlaps with what is normative behavior. Um, and uh, so that's why it's difficult. And then even if people do think that there's something uh, serious going on that they need to pay attention to, then they think, well, well where do I go? Do I go to my GP? Uh, do I go to my clergyman? Do I go to a psychologist, a social worker, a therapist? Do I go to some kind of you know, holistic retreat? Um, there's this uh, fuzzy notion about what mental health care is. And it's not just being nice to people. It's not just um, listening when people say things that are distressing them. Uh, it's going to a mental health professional that can make a distinction between what's a serious indication of the beginning of a mental disorder or what is something that's just um, more of this kind of normal uh, fluctuations in mental state in relation to your, your, your current uh, life circumstances. Yeah, and I would I would say also see a professional as you've just stated. Uh, don't 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 consult with social media. Oh, <laughs> I see, absolutely! I see a lot of social media professionals that are I don't know they don't have jobs or something, so they decided that's what they are on social media, and they're giving a lot of uh, psychological advice, which can you know, it's just it's just throwing darts at I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid you hit on a, a very big emerging problem. Um, uh, that is that, first of all, anybody can hang out a shingle and say they're a therapist. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have, to have a certain credential, you need to be licensed, a licensed psychologist, licensed social worker, licensed physician. But anybody can say they're a therapist. Um, and the other thing is that um, because of the lack of uh, mental health care facilities, meaning clinics, uh, mental health professionals, from psychiatrists, psychologists, um, psych psychiatric nurses, um, because of the, the the gap, it's being filled by companies that think digital technology is the answer, and uh, uh, you're going to be able to basically get on a phone or pull up an app and get some kind of mental health first aid, and that'll do the trick. Um, mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. Uh, these are basically 
I won't say fly by night ventures. They're basically um, commercially motivated uh, ventures that are filling a void in our healthcare system that uh, uh, aren't intended to be harmful, but they're certainly not going to uh, do the trick in terms of providing the needs to the population in terms of mental health care. There you go. You know, it, it, and and I think, you know, what you just spoke to, do people have an attitude that, well, this can be just a quick fix, like like a physical illness. I just take a pill and, you know, call me in the morning doctor sort of thing. Mental illness, you know, takes longer to fix, doesn't it? Absolutely. It takes, it, first of all, it takes more time to diagnose, mm-hmm. longer to fix, and it's not a one. It's not a one and done thing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in the book, I have many examples of clinical cases, and among the most uh, tragic are individuals. And this is part of why I wanted to write about schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a brain disorder mm. that is caused by a certain genetic predisposition. Um, not one gene, but multiple genes. And it's similar to other medical conditions like type 2 diabetes, essential hypertension that are called complex genetic medical disorders because it involves multiple genes producing additively susceptibility to the illness. Um, But it's a particularly cruel mental illness because it comes on when people are coming into the prime of their life, their late adolescents, young adults, uh, it can strike anybody. It's an equal opportunity disease. We're men, women, all races, all geographic, ethnic groups. It can be the valedictorian, cheerleader, you know, popular person, or you can be kind of the loner or nerd. Um, and it comes on just as you're beginning to begin your life. Uh, when the symptoms occur, most people have no idea what's going on. They just know, wow, this person is acting very different. I don't know what's going on, drugs, or is he having a bad day or not sleeping? And if it persists and they do get treated or hospitalized, um, they think, wow, I'm glad that's over. Uh, I'm going to go back to school or I'm going to go back to what I was doing. And they want to get back to it quickly, not lose the semester. Uh, If they're taking medication, which they should be, they often are having side effects that they don't like, or they don't like the stigma of having to think they need something to keep themselves mentally stable. Mm-hmm. So they stop it, and then they relapse. And uh, flash forward, you then begin to slide down the slippery slope of intellectual deterioration because schizophrenia is a progressive disorder, mm-hmm. and it leads people to a state a chronic stage of the illness that can uh, involve them having persistent symptoms, even in the face of treatment, Mm -hmm. and be functionally disabled. So they're not able to even come close to fulfilling whatever their potential might have been. And we see this, you know, with people on the streets who aren't getting treatment, with people in state mental hospitals. And the real purpose or the real bottom line or most optimistic and important message of the book is that it doesn't have to be that um, the key to this dreaded, historically mysterious, misunderstood condition is early detection and intervention. Mm -hmm. You can nip it in the bud, but it has to be recognized and has to be correctly treated. And I think you speak to something broader too, like we mentioned before. People need if you if you think you need help, uh, seek it out. Uh, don't wait and and uh, have it looked at. I had an, one of my best employees, uh, my company over the years, uh, had a son. She she had a son who had schizophrenia, and he had a lot of problems. I mean, constantly, you know, uh, interactions with the police and getting arrested and different things that were going on with his life and and how he was behaving with schizophrenia and he'd been diagnosed with it and lived with it for years and and to see the fallout of uh in her life of being a caretaker for it and people's schizophrenia was was just massive it left an indelible print on my on me um how, how much of the population is you know, w- fits within the diagnosis of schizophrenia or, or probably should fit in. <laughs> more, more than most people think. So mm-hmm. um, if you talk about mental illness in general, and I'm not talking about the worried well or anything, again, I'm talking about, you know, hardcore conditions. Um, about 20% of the population 
will suffer from schizophrenia or suffer from a disease in their lifetime, a mental disorder in their lifetime. Now, schizophrenia affects one in a hundred people. Wow. So in the United States, that's about three million people. Wow. Uh, and it's a condition that once you've got it, it you've got it for life. Wow. Um, it's not like you'll get over, like you, you know, get over the chicken pox or the measles. Um, it's a recurrent condition. And uh, if it's allowed to recur, meaning through relapses, um, then or not getting treated because of either neglect or, or you know, uh, disbelief, um, it then produces a irreversible damage in the brain that leads to mental disability. Oh wow! Um, so uh, it's it's occurs young. It, if not taken care of, which it hasn't been historically optimally, it becomes disabling. But it doesn't kill you like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's uh, uh, or ALS, other neurodegenerative diseases. It disables you, and so individuals who have it become wards of society meaning on Medicaid, SSI disability, uh, requiring government resources, and it also results in caregiver burden to their families, so they become estranged from them. Mm -hmm. It's very cruel. Uh, but there's one other thing, Chris, that's also an example of how our society, you know, there's some things in life that we don't have any solutions to, or we have to find new knowledge to understand. So you know, ALS, you know, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, you know, you're just uh, out of luck if you have that until we get a big breakthrough or even Alzheimer's disease or, or big worldwide problems, global warming, you know, distribution of wealth, bioterrorism. Those are, um, we have the tools to, to treat schizophrenia. We have the tools to prevent somebody who's got a bright future and comes down with the illness but doesn't understand what it is. We have the tools to prevent them from suffering the consequences of becoming a ward of society, but we don't deploy them. So our society, our government, is not serving us well and paying attention. And, and to make matters worse, uh, this trend we have now with liberalizing access to recreational, what previously were recreational drugs, cannabis, psychedelics uh, is going to increase the frequency of schizophrenia. Really? Because cannabis is a trigger for people who are vulnerable to develop it. Oh, wow. And the incidence will definitely go up as more and more states uh, make it easier to get. Wow. That's, that's interesting to note. Um, you know, I, I've met people over the years when I've met people that have usually addiction problems, there's their reaction to drugs is different. Like I've, I've known people that like, uh, for instance, you know, if I drink, I, I get relaxed and I get very chill and I just, I just want to be like, yeah, man. All right, cool. But I've met people that, that when they, especially uh, they have an addiction to gen, gen, uh, genetic addiction to alcohol, their reaction to it is completely different. Like the opposite um, where they, they become jacked up they become very belligerent. They become problematic. They become very uh, combatant. It's like the it's like it's like a real opposite thing. I've seen the same thing with cocaine and different other drugs, where most people that will take it will be very you know they'll, they'll have a, a, a very common reaction. But then I'll see other people that will take it uh, in a smaller percentage, where their reaction is the complete is a complete different thing. And usually those are the people that have the problems with with those sort of drugs. And it, it's interesting how that, you know, I've often gone like, Jesus, how, how come you, you know, you take this, you know, you drink some booze and suddenly you're the, the biggest, loudest asshole, belligerent, you know, uh, and I've actually seen like a, a sight a physiological change to them too, as well. Uh, I, I had one girlfriend who had an alcohol problem and her face would literally change. It was like Dr. Jekyll and, and Dr. Hyde, which is probably where that story comes from in that sort of issue of mental illness. Right. Well, you know, what you're describing is the heterogeneity of uh, meaning the variation in in pharmacologic response that people have. And that's just a, a biologic reality. Wow. In other words, you know, most people have similar reactions to things. So, for example, you know, if you 
take aspirin, it'll help to relieve a headache or lower your fever. Um, or if you take a slug of, uh, of um, vodka, you know, it'll make you kind of uh, calmer and more relaxed, less anxious, more talkative, you know, more kind of uh, uh, congenial. Um, mm -hmm. But some people react in a very different way um, and they become irritable and hostile or they fall asleep or they become physically flushed and uh, feel like you know, they're uncomfortable and jumping out of their skin. Um, but then also, if you continue to use the substance because you like it, mm -hmm. um, you then develop a tolerance to it and you need to drink or take more of it to get a similar kind of effect that you had initially. And then that leads you down the slippery slope to addiction. Yeah. Um, but if you take 100 people and if you give them, okay, well, let's take the current um, uh, uh, bad, bad person or bad drug, uh, OxyContin, opiate addiction. If you take 100 people and you treat them for ostensible back pain or something with OxyContin, um, only about a third of them are susceptible to addiction. Mm. So uh, uh, it's not like uh, everyone who takes it is going to develop it. Um, but everyone who takes it, you know, there could be a lot of variability in it. When I take a history from a patient that I'm evaluating, I, as part of the routine history of their symptoms, their medical history, their family history, I also ask them about, you know, their recreational drug use history and what is their reaction, not because I'm going to snitch on them or anything, but because how they react to things is diagnostic. And if you... If they uh, smoke pot and they say they get paranoid, immediately that's a tip off. Yeah. If you are anxious and you drink alcohol and it helps you, that's a tip off to uh, having a general anxiety disorder or panic disorder, which alcohol is a very good anxiolytic for. The problem is, is it wears off and you have to drink more to keep going. Yeah. Um, so what you're describing is uh, uh, actually a real phenomenon and it's an important uh, indicator of somebody's uh, not just a reaction to that. You know, in fact, what I say is what's your favorite recreational drug, mm -hmm. you know, and if they say cocaine. Um, <laughs> so if, if you're, if you're susceptible to psychotic disorders and you happen to like, or, or get into cocaine or methamphetamine or worse, you're in big trouble because those are the major, major precipitants of psychosis. Mm -hmm. um, but the point I'm trying to make, though, is that our, our, our society by arguing... So it's hard to say that cannabis is more dangerous than alcohol or tobacco. Mm -hmm. You know, These are recreational intoxicants that people can have access to, and nobody you know, uh, forbids them legally. Um, on the other hand... Uh, for some people, cannabis is going to be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a bad thing if you have this susceptibility to psychotic disorder. And it's a bad thing, particularly if people use it during adolescence, because then it affects your, your maturational development of your brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, I've, I, there's a lot of discussion about this stuff. And, and I think more and more people, I think, I think I'm going to start walking around with psychiatrist cards in my pocket. I can just <laughs> hand them to family and friends um and oh, you know, i can just be like get the hell you know uh, so when i started writing for the uh, uh you know for the lay media um uh it was hard to get people interested in a, a semi-scientific subject like mental illness or schizophrenia or brain function um but the the one article that i wrote that had the most hits was uh titled the profession everybody needs but nobody wants <laughs> Psychiatry is kind of like dentists, uh, I guess, or something. Yeah. Well, is there also, a, is... Yeah, also, people have a different have have a, have a have a somewhat dated view of it. They think of, of psychiatry as like Freud, you know, laying on a couch, mm -hmm. free associating, talking about your dreams and your toilet training and so forth. And that's that's not the current state of psychiatry. Let me ask you this. Uh, you know, one thing we've we've had a lot of authors on the show and talked a lot about is. It, it, and it's interesting to me uh, in, in the life patterns of some of the people we've found on the show, but how much childhood trauma ends up 
you know, you, you can see the fallout through most people's life. I mean, you can see my fallout through my life uh, in looking back and, and how much uh, childhood trauma sometimes. I heard it said one time that people that are a large part of people that are in drug rehab or had drug problems or addiction problems had childhood trauma. Uh, do you see a lot of that with schizophrenia and, and other maladies? Uh, is that a correct is that a correct analysis? Well, childhood uh, trauma, experiential trauma, is a potentially toxic uh, 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 effect on the brain and on people in general. Um, you know, the most extreme form of it we see with uh, you know soldiers in combat and PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, but anybody could experience it. You know, you get mugged or you're in an uh, fire or an earthquake or an auto accident. Um, children, however, um, when they experience trauma, whether it's through parental abuse or uh, any other type of uh, you know, catastrophic event, they handle it in a different way mm. than adults do. And although at the time it may appear that they're pretty resilient and you know, not uh, acting or not seeming to have been very disturbed, uh, by the event or the uh, repeated events, uh, it's affecting them and it affects them in a way that comes out later in life. So there's something called, um, uh, when somebody has a diagnosis of depression, for example, meaning that they have mood disturbances, their, their ability to maintain a normal emotional state is disrupted and they just can't get out of feeling horrible. I mean, this is not just, I feel sad. This is like physical pain that you can't endure. And there's some wonderful first person accounts on this. Uh, William Styron wrote, wrote Darkness Visible. Uh, Andrew Solomon wrote The Noonday Demon. Uh, Kay Jamison wrote An Unquiet Mind. Yeah, these are physically palpable pain that you feel, not just like, oh, you know, uh, I, I, I didn't win at uh, poker last night or my girlfriend broke up with me. Um, uh, so um, uh, you know, the, the um, notion of, of you know, what something is is something that people don't necessarily appreciate and uh, understand sort of what needs to be done. Um, but, um, you know, when I say and this is to parents particularly, um, it's better to err on the side of caution mm -hmm. you know, uh, and seek a consultation to make sure. So, you know, kids may have a terrible thing happen to them and they may look like normal, mm -hmm. but then if later in life they experience the onset of an anxiety disorder or a mood disorder like depression, uh, its ability to be treated and for them to have a good outcome is much more difficult if they have this prior traumatic experience. And there's a very large scientific literature on this. Mm. Um, the question is though, how do you measure trauma? Mm. Uh, you know, you, you, if somebody can say, Oh, I had a bad experience, you know, with a, uh, a teacher who was a bully in class, or there was a class bully in school. Um, there's no way we can really measure trauma. Mm. Um, so it's, it's getting an accurate history. Mm -hmm. and then trying to evaluate what are the likely effects of that on an individual. But the key distinction I guess I'm trying to make is that trauma is something that can affect people at any stage of life, but it has a particularly different and, and uh, uh, onerous one in children. And the last thing I'll say about it uh, is um, in the, some of the more extreme cases that I've seen, this is a fascinating condition that we don't know a lot about. Um, the adult consequence of childhood trauma, whether it's emotional abuse, physical abuse, or sexual abuse, uh, are uh, conditions called dissociative states. Mm. Now, uh, dissociative states are th things where the most, the most uh, dramatic and extreme version of a dissociative state is multiple personality. Mm -hmm. When somebody actually can transition from the way they usually are to a totally different type of individual and act in a totally different kind of way mm. and frequently have no memory of it. Um, but the more common thing is that uh, kids who have grown up after having sustained 
childhood trauma in a very uh, severe way, um, they will uh, have times when they will kind of dissociate, go off into another state of mind mm. that often has uh, behaviors that are completely inconsistent with their normal personality. So someone who is kind of a bookish, conservative, work-oriented young woman might become you know, very provocative and, uh, and, and engage in promiscuous or risky behaviors. Uh, and then this reverts back after some period of time. Um, but it's a very dangerous condition, and yeah. it's one that we don't have good treatments for now. But, um, uh, you know, you've seen movies like uh, um, The Three Faces of Eve or... Uh, uh, Brilliant Mind? No, Brilliant Mind... Uh, uh, that was schizophrenia. Uh, that was schizophrenia. Yeah, uh, John Nash had a card-carrying schizophrenia, no question. And his son has it, too. So wow. you know, the family history is consistent with that also jesus um let's open the scope up a little bit more because i i, I want i always want our show everybody we have on our show we want to educate people and make them smarter with a little bit of comedy we've woven in um we we talked a bit about before the show about you know one, one of the things that concerns me is people using social media as a medical diagnosis for just about anything whether it's uh, you know being overweight or addiction or or, you know, and one of the prevalences that I've seen, especially on TikTok, this has become a real big thing with TikTok. And it concerns me because, you know, yesterday the TikTok CEO was uh, testifying before Congress, so it's prevalent in the news. But it, it, it's so prevalent, and I see so many videos and so many, quote-unquote, experts that have no degree uh, and are, are just uh, armchair quarterback uh, people who've somehow turned – being coaches into in diagnosing narcissism and narcissism I've seen in recent years, especially someone who dates a lot. Um, you know, I, I, it's, it seems almost like 100% of people that I date in, in mode right now, they will tell me that their prior boyfriends were narcissists and every, the last 10 boyfriends they ever had in their life were narcissists. And it seems like the, it's become this communal social media narrative that, that 95% of the population, especially men, are narcissists. And I don't think that figure's true based on what I Google, but I shouldn't believe anything on the internet. So do you want to speak to that and why that's become such a <laughs> conversation piece in our thing? Or is am I am I giving an accurate description? Am I just insane? No, you, you are. You are. <laughs> the problem is, is that um, the way narcissism is used uh, in these instances is more as an adjective than as a diagnosis. Mm. Um, and uh, we've got a real problem here. Um, uh, how bad it'll be, we'll find out, I guess. But um, uh, social media, the internet, and then social media is like catnip or cryptocurrency to to personality and behavior. Um, it it gives people license to do things that they've never had before. You know, I mean. If somebody, you could say narcissism is like egotism. You know, he's egotistic. It's all about himself or herself. Um, well, yeah, I mean, everybody would like to be somewhat self-interested and self-serving. But, you know, we have normative limits that are called, you know, consciences or or good behavior or a sense of proportion. Um, but uh, social media encourages people to just get outside normal boundaries because one, you know, you can easily do it. You can do it semi-anonymously um, and don't take responsibility. You don't have to, you don't have to really validate or justify what you're saying or doing. You know, you can mm -hmm. just express your opinion or show yourself. I mean, you know, look at this guy, George Santos, who just made up his whole resume and everything. Yes. Um, you know, you on the internet, you can just create your own persona yeah. Uh, and there's no responsibility. Yeah. Um, now, narcissism is a term that's actually the term came from this Greek uh, uh, legend or story about Narcissus, who was the person who uh, was so consumed with their own uh, beauty or appearance that they he stared at himself in a pool of water to see his image and then ultimately drowned because he fell in. Um, <laughs> So, you know, that's how the term arrived in it. But narcissism in a clinical sense means somebody who is so self-involved and self-interested 
that um, they're ignorant uh, of other people's needs or, or reactions. Um, and they re, you know, their relationship with other people are simply to serve their own purposes. And they're constantly self-referential in anything that happens. You know, like you're telling a story about, oh, you know, I was going into this um, uh, uh, restaurant and uh, I saw such and such a person and he invited me to sit down and have uh, a drink with them. And, and the person says, well, yeah, the other day I was doing the same thing and here's what happened. So everything is self-referential. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's an overvaluation, an overpreoccupation, and a uh, devaluation and uh, a lack of, of, of recognition of other individuals and uh, uh, other sort of external elements in the person's you know, reality. Um, I, I don't want to make any kind of political statement, but you know, the term has gained new visibility and, and understanding with our former president, who was very much, you know, uh, illustrated a lot of those kinds of behaviors. So narcissism is considered what's called a personality disorder, mm -hmm. meaning it's psychologic as opposed to biologic. Mm -hmm. It's not the brain so much as it is uh, the person's uh, personality from the way they've been raised and uh, whatever they've inherited from their parents that may also have been, you know, inclined of that sort. Um, but I think, you know, your observation is accurate, is that the Internet has encouraged this expression more. And there's one other thing that uh, I, I think is definitely relevant, um, and that gets back to the culture thing I was saying and the pathoplastic features that can encourage pathology uh, from the cultural environment. Um, America is a country that was built on the ethos of a rugged individualist uh, who is there for personal freedom, self-determination, master of their own destiny. And so, uh, you know, there's a, a cultural ethos of encouraging people to be express their individualism. And um, in doing so, and now with the internet, they can express their individualism in this way that provides access and anonymity. Uh, the problem is, is that um, it's you can you can reduce it to kind of uh, I guess I would say um, individual narcissistic immaturity. In other words, mm. a kid just says yells, "I want this" or "I want that" or "Look at me" or "I want to I want uh, to go here." Um, you know, the internet, the, the country, sort of encourages people to fulfill their dreams live their own lives, uh, uh, be individualists as opposed to conformists and, uh, and adhering to convention, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, to do it without any kind of encumbrances or, or inhibitions. Um, that, that, that's, that's what kids do. That's not what adults who are responsible members of society do. So you're right, there is this uh, proliferation of narcissistic behaviors and then faux diagnoses being leveled at people, not because they have the disorders, but because they're behaving in that way. Um, but, you know, our society is encouraging it both from our historical culture, as well as this more recent uh, uh, advent or of the internet, which is social media. Yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, you know, I'm pulling this up with, uh, I think this is from uh, the Cleveland clinic. Uh, a common narcissistic personality disorder is up to 5% of people that have, uh, it's estimated, um, and uh, is one of 10 personality disorders. Uh, there's another report that males may have it up to 7.7% in general population, 4.8 females. But I, the, my, dis, my concern is that I see, like, I'm trying to pull it up on TikTok here. Um, there are billions of views about narcissism on social media and you see people talk about it and like you i i agree with you i you know we saw uh some of the psychiatrists uh groups write books about the narcissism of of president trump and it's not political i mean this is definitely something that uh you look at and you go well it, it kind of brought the discussion and uh i'm looking at i'm looking at the term narcissist the hashtag on tiktok alone it's 8.5 billion views 
And um, there's not that many people in the freaking world, people. <laughs> like, right. like, so, some, so somebody's attributing a diagnosis that they yeah. probably have to more people than actually exist. Yeah, exactly. It's it's and it's insane. You look, I've, I looked down the list of narcissism hashtag just on TikTok alone, and and I I can't go any day on TikTok without seeing some person claiming that they're you know a narcissist and then all their prior boyfriends or girlfriends are narcissism. And what's interesting to me is, is also there is, there is a state of, of, of men and women relations of dark triadism of why women are attracted to men with dark triad traits and why they want men to lead. And there's the biology of, of why women are, uh, you know, attracted to that sort of thing, a narcissist, you know, physical sort of thing. You know, if you study hybristophilia and why women are attracted to people of hybristophilia um, that are prisoners or death row inmates, you know, like I, I, I've seen that where I'm like, how come, how come the guy, you know, at one point, what was his face was getting married. The guy who killed a bunch of people with the gang, the cult and um, Charles Manson was getting married. And I'm like, how come Charles Manson has a girlfriend and I don't <laughs> like what's the hell is going on with that? <laughs> but the only reason I'm talking about this is I just want to bring a light to people that please don't use social media as a psychological or a psychological diagnosis. Please go see a medical professional. Please go see someone with a, <laughs> with a degree. And and uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It, social media has become really weird. Like anything that's the topic of the week, everyone's a professional expert on it. Suddenly, like you know, when the balloon, the Chinese balloons were getting shot in the sky suddenly everybody in my social media feed was was the ultimate professional on you know with years of experience on what what uh, chinese yeah. balloons are in the well, sky it's, 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 it's a little bit like you know the legend of prometheus prometheus discovers fire and fire can be used for good or bad purposes mm. social the internet was an amazing discovery but this purpose is a double-edged sword but uh there's let me just give you there, there's different kinds of what might be called narcissistic behavior um, there's good narcissism is bad narcissism. So bad narcissism is somebody who's so self-involved and self-consumed that that's all they ever think about. It's no one else, nothing else. It's just all about them. Mm -hmm. um, good narcissism is somebody, let's say, who has a messianic, uh, uh, you know, sort of attitude or motivation. In other words, they think so highly of themselves. I'm so smart and I'm so capable and I have a mission and I'm going to save the world. And they actually go out and try and do that, but mm -hmm. you know, in a sincere way, well intended, um, not solely to uh, bring attention to themselves, but to be the person that can do good for the world, and they'll get the credit for it, or uh, uh, they'll be able to bring it about. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of a grandiose narcissism, which is good. Um, and then a third kind is what describe me there. I should mention. Well, there you go. There you go. Well, you're doing a little bit. Depends on your guests on your podcast, I guess. Um, uh, but um, uh, the people with schizophrenia ha are also defined by a narcissistic quality. Mm. It's it's one that doesn't hurt anybody except themselves. They're so consumed with their own symptoms, their delusions, their hallucinations. They're trying to figure out what is going on. Uh, in their head or in their world um, because it's at variance with the external reality. They're creating their own reality because their psychotic symptoms are so intense that they take them as being, you know, the gospel truth, the absolute reality that's going on, mm -hmm. even though, you know, there's not really people after them, even though the CIA hasn't put a computer chip in their body, even though that, the neighbors aren't trying to poison, even though they're, the voices they're hearing aren't real voices of people who are saying bad things about them. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, there's there's really different forms of this. But, um, I, you know, I personally think about the, the social media is there should be more curation of it. But then Definitely. you've got free speech and you've got freedom of expression. You know, well, that's not always good. And yeah. I don't know what the answer is, but there should be some curation that... Uh, and people say, well, that's censorship. Well, you know, um, it's not necessarily bad to make sure that stuff that gets posted has some, you know, legitimacy to it and uh, is not uh, overtly offensive.
You know, you bring up a really good point that I, I, I think I'm going to become an advocate for. You know, we had this thing during COVID where they would, you know, social media companies would put like a disclaimer. Like any author we had on talking about COVID or whatever on YouTube, there's like a little disclosure that would come up about COVID and, you know, health risks and, and you know, you should be careful what sort of information you're looking at. They, I, I think they need to do this on social media and like TikTok. Like if someone's talking about a medical diagnosis, whether it's physical or mental and psychologic psychology cases, you know, for instance, that what we discussed about with narcissism or any sort of other malady that some amateur quarterback, <laughs> armchair quarterback has decided they're the expert on this week, there should be like some sort of thing that says like, you know, this person has some interesting uh, freedom of expression ideas, but please, if you really want to study narcissism, get professional help. And I think maybe there should be a disclosure of that maybe more often. Well, that I mean, that 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 I think you know, runs into our political ethos. This thing about uh, um, you know, a government staying out of people's lives, um, uh, even though that isn't you know, isn't the case. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, so you know, you can't have it both ways. But um, narcissism, a fundamental uh, uh, element or of our narcissism is immaturity, because mm -hmm. okay? uh, all children are narcissistic. Mm -hmm. All children are narcissistic, and, and you grow out of that. You mm -hmm. grow out of that as a result of peer pressure, um, s cultural uh, uh, norms, um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know being incentivized or, or disincentivized to conduct yourself in different ways. Um, you know, if you act like a boar that only talks about yourself, you know people are going to run away from you. Oh, you just described me, so. Well, <laughs> you've got a pretty, you've got a pretty good listening audience, so uh, I don't think it's working in a negative way for you. They're they're here for the car crash. They're just waiting for me to hit the wall. That's what I'm told. They're <laughs> well, just like they're watching, going any day now. He's gonna well, hit it. Right, right, like like a Formula One race, huh? <laughs> pretty much, yeah. yeah. Um, Let me ask you about one more thing before we wrap up the show, because I know we've we've gone pretty long, but I think this is an important discussion for people. Because the main message of the show I want to take into is people should buy your book and uh, in and understand uh, psychology more, but also seek professional help. Uh, there's been two times in my life where my depression and anxiety have gotten so bad where I had to go get chemicalized and, and get some help and they were the best things for me because i was becoming very self-destructive um you you alluded earlier in the show about gaming disorders uh and, and maladies that may be not quite reaching the level of of and, and in the cases i'm sure different variant but you know there's been a lot of interesting things that's come out of psychology lately where there's been some criticism of how th it seems to be expanding quite a bit of different maladies like you mentioned gaming disorder. I know one malady that I'm I'm not ha excited about is is uh, is evidently some psychiatrists determine that uh, masculinity is toxic and is a is a mental disease or suggested it was a mental disease or implied that it was. Um, is is that happening in the world? Are we really generating more diagnoses or more mental illnesses, or is maybe woke culture getting a little out of control with? just making everything a d disease, you know, kind of like what I'm seeing with narcissism. A lot of people that I see declare, you know, that their prior relationship persons were narcissism is really just them not taking self accountability and going, Hey, maybe it's me. Exactly. Cause it's always me. I know it's me, but. <laughs> so, so, so I was president of the American psychiatric association in 2013 and 14 when the current or the most current version of the diagnostic statistical manual which is the Bible of Diagnoses, was launched. And there was a, a lot of controversy and criticism about uh, proliferating diagnoses and pathologizing normal behavior. Um, and uh, from a clinical medical standpoint, I can tell you that is not happening and that is not the goal mm -hmm. um, or the intent. Uh, when somebody talks about toxic masculinity, they're basically engaging in an ideological uh, mm -hmm. an ideological uh, strategy to call attention to something that um, they feel is pernicious or want to. And so they're weaponizing uh, a clinical diagnosis as a way to do it. Just mm -hmm. like now um, you know, with cancel culture, you know, we've weaponized um, certain things that are called microaggressions or implicit bias uh, to take out people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so this is not, but on the other hand, 
uh, and this is important, although I don't know how to say it in a few words. Um, <clears throat> any throughout history, when as medicine evolved, all diseases were recognized and described and diagnosed in the same way, meaning the first thing that was done was to describe them. So people that had epilepsy had falling sickness, like Caesar. People that had uh, congestive heart failure had dropsy, meaning that they had edema in their ankles, and the fluid dropped to their legs. Mm. Um, people that had diabetes, could uh, the doctor tasted their urine. If it was sweet, it was mellitus. If it was uh, watery, it was insipid, insipidus. Um, but then when science and technology were developed, you could measure glucose, you could do EKGs, you could do EEGs. And so you had a laboratory diagnosis of the condition. And then the third level is, oh, can you discover the actual cause? Uh, I have pneumococcal pneumonia. I can mm. actually grow the bacteria in culture. Um, or uh, I have Huntington's disease. I can identify the gene that causes the symptoms of the disorder. Mental illnesses are still at the first level, wow. describing the symptoms. You know, narcissism is acting in the way that we've described. Schizophrenia is based on the occurrence of delusions, hallucinations, thought disorganization. Depression is sadness uh, and sleep disturbance and uh, uh, worry beyond the scope of the person's circle. So we're still doing it phenomenologic. So it's easy prey to say, oh, masculinity is toxic, um, or to say that sexual addiction by somebody who's a, you know, a womanizer or a manizer, you know, and seeks a lot of sexual partners. Um, it's just descriptive, but it's an opinion. It's not actual evidence that's doing it. And as you've been referring to, you know, the internet gives people a bigger voice than they've ever had before to be able to do it. So um, let me just say, because I know that we, uh, we need to wrap up, that if people are wondering if they listen to this, oh, uh, I need to be more sensitive to my family members and friends' behavior, and uh, if I recognize something that I'm concerned about, what should I do? The, the guidance is this, um, be over involved, not under-involved. Um, and you start at the top when you seek help, meaning you go to a psychiatrist and preferably at an academic teaching center first, and then you can work your way down if it's not anything serious to a therapist that they can refer you to. But the point is, is that um, uh, people, if somebody is drinking too much, if somebody is acting bizarre, if somebody appears morose and talks about life not being worth living, um, they usually are kind of feel uncertain what to do, what to say, oh, it's not my business, and I don't want to say anything that's going to be, uh, you know, taken the wrong way. Say something. Mm -hmm. By asking, you'll never push anybody in the direction of something bad happening. It's better to ask than to stay silent. Definitely, definitely. I love that as a PSA, and that's what I was planning on wrapping the show with. Um, what, what's the best way for people, the, the quickest way to reach out? Because as you mentioned before, people can wait too long to get help. I've been guilty of that. In fact, that people, you know, they'll ask on social media, they'll be like, if you could go back to your childhood self and teenage self and tell yourself a word of wisdom, what would it be? I'm like, uh, go get psychological help, Chris Voss. Uh, go get some help now. Uh, childhood trauma and looking back through 50 years of childhood trauma and 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 seeing the wreckage uh, is is not good. Don't don't be me. And and a lot of people suffer from that. So uh, what's the best way to reach out uh, if you think you need help or if you have a loved one that you think you need help? Should you hand them a card? Or should you get them a phone number? Uh, what, what's the best way to kind of uh, make that decision and cross that line so you don't wait? Well, I, I try and do what I can to uh, uh, respond or guide people. And if you go to my website, uh, jeffreylibermanmd.com, um, <clears throat> that's a way to connect uh, to myself. Um, but, you know, people live in all kinds of geographic areas and different circumstances. Um, if best thing to do initially is to ask your GP mm -hmm. for a referral. Um, if they say, well, God, I don't know any psychiatrist or none that I trust, um, then I would call the uh, medical school mm. and the office of the chair of psychiatry. 
ask and say, uh, I'm having anxiety, I'm having a you know drinking problem, a drug problem, um, depression, whatever. Uh, who on your faculty is the specialist in this area that I could see? Um, and uh, to go that way, there's also the American Psychiatric Association, which have local branches in each uh, uh, city. Um, uh, but you may have to search because, uh, like I said to you initially, the access and availability is just not comparable to general medical care or other medical specialty care. And there's one other thing I'll say, Chris, that I feel a little bit... Uh, uh, uncomfortable, but I think it's just so true that I should say it. Um, you know, do you know anybody that goes to the second best doctor? <laughs> Everybody thinks they're the best doctor. So there's good doctors and there's less good doctors. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to psychiatry, there's more variability. And that's mm -hmm. because the field is still, you know, is, is the, um, was the late bloomer of medical specialties. Uh, um, so you have to do a little bit of searching sometimes, but people do that. You know, when you have cancer and you don't get a good response from the initial treatment, people look, go online, they look at protocols in different places, they'll travel. Um, I'm not suggesting you have to do that, but you may have to do a little work, but a, a, a lot of what I do is re-diagnosing people or changing the treatment regimens from bad ones to the correct ones. Um, so you may have to put some effort in, but it's worth it. Because when it comes to severe mental illnesses like schizophrenia, it's a, definitely a situation in which a stitch in time saves nine. Yeah. And don't wait, people. And, and don't consult with TikTok and social media. Like, get, seek professional help. Please quit hiring and, and paying people and listening to people that, you know, they just decided last week they're the professional in this. They deal with professionals, people who have studied this, gone to college, gotten degrees, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Please, please stop using social media as a, the, as a way to... the best physicians don't have a lot of time to spend <laughs> doing that. I can tell you that. There's a good point. There's a good point. So please reach out. I encourage everyone and don't wait. I, I, I can cite some examples in my life, but we don't have enough time right now. But there's times where I've dealt with anxiety and depression when in my business life and uh, get help as soon as possible. Reach out if you think you need help. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. And, it, and you're actually a better person for going, hey, maybe I need help. Let's, uh, let's take a look down the journey. Maybe you don't. You know, and but it's better to be introspective in that way than just think that uh, you're the perfect human being in the world, which is, you know, what I do. Don't, anyway, don't try and tough it out and don't, yeah. don't 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 be cowed by stigma. There you go. There you go. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for coming on the show. We really appreciate coming on, giving some insight and hopefully we've opened some minds and educated some people and we can save some lives. Appreciate it, Chris. Thank you very much. There you go. Uh, order up the book, folks. Wherever fine books are sold, stay away those alleyway bookstores because they're dirty. So go to the good ones. I don't know what that means. I'm just kidding around. Uh, anyway, guys, Malady of the Mind, Schizophrenia and the Path to Prevention. It's out on hardcover, paperback, audiobook, and Kindle, and audio CD, wherever fine books are sold. February 21st, 2023, Jeffrey A. Lieberman has been on the show with us today. And as always, we enjoy our audience tuning in and some of the great comments we get. Uh, be sure to go to goodreads.com, for chess Chris Foss, youtube.com, for chess Chris Foss, uh, LinkedIn, all that good stuff. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time. And that should